Uh, there are a lot of things in life that I didn't enjoy until I found out why someone else enjoyed them. And that applies to food and music and things like that. And hymns are certainly one of those. And this occasional series I love because I love to hear why someone else loves a song, uh, a hymn we sing in the church. And this morning, uh, our provost, Dr. Mark Sargent, is going to uh, enter into the joy of hymns with us and tell us why he likes a particular hymn. Mark, coming up. Good morning, everyone. I don't know about you, but I love Thanksgiving break. One day for turkey, one day for leftovers, two days to procrastinate on your homework. It's also a chance to catch up with all the family members who have Verizon plans. Uh, yes, I love Thanksgiving. Uh, so I'd like to introduce for you a very familiar Thanksgiving hymn, We Gather Together. In the fall of 1986, soon after my wife Arlene and I were married, uh, we moved to the Netherlands, where I taught American literature courses at a Dutch university. One of the cities that we were anxious to visit was Leiden. Arlene's father, a Dutch immigrant to the United States, was born on the edges of this town, not far from the birthplace of the painter Rembrandt. I had also just finished a doctoral dissertation on a small group of religious separatists that we call the Pilgrims. Before they sailed on the Mayflower in 1620, the Pilgrims had fled England and settled in Leiden for nearly 12 years. At that time, the town was famous for many things, including its university, which was a center of major debates between the Calvinists and the Arminians. It was during our first visit as Arlene and I were leaving the train station and moving into the historic center of town that we heard the bells in the cathedral, the Paterskirk, play the tune we gather together. And at first I thought this was simply a clever trick that the Dutch had added for American tourists to let the noontime bells play a Thanksgiving hymn. I would learn, though, that it was the other way around, that the famous anthem of the American Thanksgiving was actually an old Dutch hymn. It was written in the late 16th century to celebrate the victory of the Dutch against invading forces from Spain. It was a time when the city of Leiden particularly suffered through starvation and duress. Many years later, in 1897, an American would loosely translate the words into English, and the hymn soon made its way into the rituals of the American Thanksgiving. Today, when we sing the words we gather together, we often think of families that are gathered around the Thanksgiving table for prayer. But the phrase originally was politically loaded. In the 16th century, the Spanish invaders had prohibited the Dutch Protestants from gathering for worship. And if you listen to the rest of the lyrics in the hymn, you can catch something of its initial flavor. Gratitude for God's protection and liberation during the war. It is no surprise then that this Dutch hymn regained popularity in both the Netherlands and the United States during World War II. For me, the hymn brings up so many personal associations. It reminds me of my childhood Thanksgiving, when I would hear my uncle speak of his fear and dislocation as an American GI during World War II. In that respect, it's appropriate that we sing it today, one day after Veterans Day. It also reminds me of living in Holland during the first year of our marriage, it reminds me of my father-in-law and the times during holidays when he held hands with his brothers and sisters and sang Dutch hymns from his childhood. There's some paradox to this hymn. While it's often been sung to convey nationalism, it is also associated with a group of religious immigrants who saw themselves as strangers and pilgrims on the earth, a phrase that they love to cite from the Geneva Bible. Those 12 years in Holland were hard years for the pilgrims. Raised in England mostly as farmers, they struggled with the mercantile society of Holland. They struggled to keep the loyalty of their children. In Leiden, they came to see themselves as followers of Christ, even if they had no country to call a home. The hymn has always been for me a song about gratitudes for God's presence in times of comfort as well as uncertainty, in times of both pensiveness and confidence when freedom was both fruitful and fearful. 
Let me mention just one final tale. When the pilgrims lived in Leiden, the town set aside three days each October to celebrate their liberation. It is interesting that the pilgrims' famous feast in America, the one we usually call the first Thanksgiving, was also a three-day affair. Historians occasionally see a connection there. And come to think of it, gratitude should be a multi-day affair. When we gather together at Thanksgiving, we should remember how gratitude often begins by recalling the faith and the fortitude of all those who came before us. You may be seated. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to pray with me a prayer of thanksgiving for our President Gail Beebe, uh, an extraordinarily gifted man who uh, does a lot of good and invisible things uh, for us as a student body. And, uh, but one of the very visible and uh, wonderful things he does for us is to speak to us uh, out of his life experience, out of the things that he's uh, spent a lot of time thinking about, reading about, and writing about. And uh, Dr. Beebe, we're, we're grateful that you're willing to get up and talk to us once in a while. So, Lord, bless your servant. Uh, may he run down the path you set for him because you set his heart free. Uh, may he have joy and clarity as he speaks. And I pray your son will be exalted and that we, your people, will be encouraged to live holy and righteous lives to give up ourselves to your service. In Jesus' name, amen. Good. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. And Mark, that was a beautiful introduction. That was uh, so thoughtful. Just loved it. And so grateful to have this context as we head towards Thanksgiving. I know many of you are just in the midst of a very hard week. Ran into some of you yesterday at Starbucks uh, who have three tests this week, and I just pray God's blessing on you. And then I ran into some of you who said last week was horrible, and next week is horrible, but this week is good. So uh, there's always a little gap where we can really experience the grace and peace of God. Last week I had the privilege of meeting with 12 of our first years uh, in a program that we started this fall, and we were in Hieronymus Lounge. And they asked me at one point, why did I develop an interest in neuroscience and where did it come from? And so I began to tell them a story that goes back almost 20 years when I was a, a professor and dean of the School of Theology at Azusa Pacific. And during that time, I was involved in teaching philosophy of religion, uh, historical theology, and also engaged in helping pastors get oriented to their work in the church. It was during this time that one of the ministers uh, had what I often refer to as a career-limiting move. And a career-limiting move is where you do something that forever changes your opportunity in that particular place and maybe uh, your opportunity in a lot of other places. And I often think back on this experience because it has just been so dramatic to me, the way in which we come to points in our life where the afflicting challenge for us spiritually and emotionally, we either conquer it or it conquers us. And what happened? What happened was, in this case, this individual had, he was a mid-career pastor. He had done something different for 20 years, retired from that job, and had gone into pastoral ministry. And he got into a situation that was just not constructive. It wasn't constructive for him and it wasn't constructive for the church. And in really just a fit of kind of unbridled anger, he ended up cussing out his elders. Now, maybe cussing out, is that like dating myself? Swear words, do we use, or is that just common? We know what a swear word is, okay. The four letter words keep going. He used all the bad language that you're not supposed to use with your elders. Now, I've always believed that every vocation has its unforgivable sin. And one of the unforgivable sins of ministry is cussing out your elders. And so 
His elder called me late that Sunday night. I got involved in it the following week, and long and short of it is he was subsequently fired the following weekend. Uh, he was unrepentant, not willing to apologize. They said this is, you know, unacceptable. And the long and short of it is he had gotten into a situation that was corrosive. It was hard on his spirit, it was hard on the church's spirit, but the worst part of it all was that what we discovered is he had had problems with the temper for over 20 years. He had never really worked to corral it. We had never seen it. Of course, we'd never seen it in a context where it manifests itself. But when it came out, it came out in such a self-destructive way. Well, as I was sharing this last week with the students, uh, three of them subsequently came to me afterwards and said, you know, essentially, I actually struggle with anger. And I would love to talk about what are some of the processes I can go through. And I said, well, actually one of the great things that we're discovering about brain science is there are things you can do. And in the midst of doing them, you actually rechannel your brain so that you can, in fact, begin to harness some of these deep temptations or deep tendencies. It's not that anger is a temptation so much as a tendency. And in the rerouting of the brain, we can actually begin to really corral or respond more constructively to the situation and circumstances in which we find themselves. Now, I went on to tell the students that night that how did this experience with anger lead me in, in other directions of intellectual curiosity? It led me to the work of Daniel Goleman. And Daniel Goleman has done pioneering work in emotional intelligence. And the core of his teaching is you have to come to self-awareness in order to make any progress. And out of self-awareness, you learn how to self-regulate. And when you become self-aware and capable of self-regulation, then you're able to become socially aware and develop empathy. And it's that capacity to develop a connection with other people that makes you aware of the experiences people have in life as they encounter you and your life. But ultimately, the goal is, how do we manage the complexity of all of our social relationships at the same time that we're growing and developing, coming to a deeper awareness and understanding of ourselves, and also needing to regulate ourselves? Now, this, this semester, we're focused on gratitude. Last week, we had just the most amazing presentation by uh, Jane Wilson in our staff forum. It's just so compact. Uh, Dr. Wilson is just a wonderful part of our Department of Education. And she was elevating for us the, important of gra the importance of gratitude. And through this whole semester of sermons, uh, it's just been wonderful to see that theme repeatedly lifted up. The Bible encourages us to give thanks more than 150 times. Uh, the psalmist David is one of the best at extolling the virtues of gratitude. Now, you know, sometimes when you read the Psalms, you wonder, what did David mean? And so I always like to read God's great interpreter, Tremper Longman, on what David would have meant. The opening of Psalm 107 is similar to that of Psalm 106. But this psalm calls on God's people to thank him for his rescue from various forms of suffering. The main stanzas have, all have a similar structure. Each narrates a deadly threat, followed by a cry for help, and then comes God's deliverance. In all of this, the psalmist is urging the people to respond with thanks. Give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, his wonderful deeds for all humankind. And then the final verse of 107 calls on the wise to pay attention, thus connecting the psalm to the wisdom traditions of the Old Testament, to pay attention. I think so much of life, and I actually think so much of chapel, is learning how to pay attention. How do we learn how to pay attention to our life and to what God is doing in our life? Moses is one of my favorite characters from the Old Testament, and he's a favorite of everyone because he's so well documented. One of the things I like about looking at Moses is he had a terrible problem with anger. The three passages of scripture that I've highlighted for you today show three different places where Moses really struggled with his temper. Exodus 2, 11 to 14. The passage is about Moses sees Hebrews being persecuted, being kind of taunted and beaten up. And so he decides to take it upon himself to murder the Egyptian. He hides the Egyptian's body. The next day, he's trying to intervene in a quarrel between two Hebrews, two Jews. And in the midst of that, they say to him, what are you going to do to us what you did to the Egyptian? Are you going to murder us? 
The second one is Exodus 32, 19. Moses has been up receiving the Ten Commandments, and he comes down, and if you know this story, if you don't, Tramper will tell you about it. The, uh, he comes down, and he sees the golden calf has been built, and the idolatry just infuriates him. And so what does he do? He smashes the Ten Commandments, and it causes him to have to go back for a second set. And then the final one is Numbers 20, 10 to 13. And he and Aaron have gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and they are going to call forth water. And actually the instruction from the Lord is to call forth water, but instead he strikes the rock kind of in anger, kind of in impulsiveness. Now, what's interesting about this passage is it's one of the two places that we hear about why Moses never got to enter the promised land. Well, I remember during a time when I was thinking through what are the deeper messages of Scripture? What are the deeper messages of these stories? And one of the things that impressed me so much was the multiple times where Moses' anger kept him from what God actually intended. You, you look at these three as just three notable examples. Exodus 2, 11 to 14. He murders an Egyptian and literally has to flee for his life. Exodus 32, 19 and following. He smashes the Ten Commandments and it delays actually the giving of the law to the people. And then Numbers 20. He literally does not get to enter the promised land. And this is one of the two places that we hear the reason or the causation of why Moses wasn't allowed to enter the promised land. So often in our own life, I think that we have tendencies that afflict us and that God has a great call in our life. He gives us gifts and abilities. We spend so much time, energy, and resource preparing for what God wants us to accomplish. And then these tendencies get the better of us. And they either redirect or even ruin our life if we don't learn how to get a handle on them. Now, my favorite personality from the early church, or at least one of my favorites, is Evagrius of Pontus. And I like him so much because he's a real living being. He often reminds me of the Apostle Peter, that even though he's always around the truth, he seems to always bungle the truth. And he lives a very real human life. And you see in his reflection on the reality of life so many of the truths that, real, that still penetrate us today. Evagrius of Pontus lived from 345 to 399 AD. He came of age in Constantinople. He was extremely well-connected. Everyone anticipated he was smart, well-connected, and they anticipated that he would have a high priestly office, that he would really become one of the great leaders in the Eastern Church in Constantinople. But the details are vague. Uh, needless to say, he fell in love with a married woman. And so he flees for his life, uh, goes first to Jerusalem, and then is not sure he's secure there, so he heads on out to the Egyptian desert. And in the midst of his fleeing and settling in this monastery in the Egyptian desert, he begins to think about, what happened? Why did I do this? I had all of these gifts, abilities, opportunities, and preparation, and what was the career-limiting mistake that completely redirected my life? And here I am on the Egyptian desert when I dreamed of providing leadership in Constantinople. Well, he comes up with the eight deadly thoughts, and these eight deadly thoughts were eventually codified by Gregory the Great into the seven deadly sins. And he began to look at what are the tendencies or temptations to which we fall prey that literally redirect the destiny of our life. Gluttony, anger, greed, envy, pride, lust, indifference, and melancholy. And the tendency that we have is to often believe that we're just stuck, that these are our tendencies, that there are personalities, and there's not a lot of true transformation that can occur. And so we kind of capitulate to the nature of life as it's been given to us and the realities that we face as a consequence of our own behavior. But Evagrius wasn't comfortable with that. He didn't believe that. He believed that that short-circuited the transforming power of Christ's love, the capacity for us to actually undergo change. And so he went about devising these systems and disciplines to actually reorder our life, to get us into habitual patterns that would actually change us. And so he came up with not just the eight deadly thoughts, but the eight life-giving virtues. And the compensating virtues, temperance, gratitude, generosity, contentment, humility, chastity, diligence, and wisdom, were meant to help us understand that when we were struggling with a tendency that actually was out to destroy us or had the potential to redirect our life, how could we pursue a compensating virtue that would actually enrich our life? And so this morning, the focus 
on anger as the vice and gratitude as the virtue helps us begin to recognize that there are things that we can do as a result of behaviors we can engage in. That the more in which we become a gracious person, the more that we learn how to pay attention in order to express gratitude, the fact that it can actually begin to redirect, not just if we have a disposition to anger, but a disposition to any of the vices that actually lead us away from God and the good for which he intends our life to be spent. Now, the... Uh, person who's had a huge impact on me in terms of my entree into neuroscience was Dr. Andrew Newberg. And back in 2009, he released a book called How God Changes Your Brain. And essentially, the book is a study conducted over a long period of time at the uh, Institute for Spirituality and Neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania. And what Andrew Newberg was trying to determine is whether or not you believe in God or pardon me, whether or not God exists, does believing in God make a fundamental difference in the outcome of your life and the disposition with which you live your life? And he said there's just overwhelming evidence that believing God exists and behaving and patterning your life in such a way to reflect that belief actually has a fundamental and dramatic change and positive impact on us. And these are at least the five areas that he emphasized that pertain to, to our consideration this morning. That religious and spiritual contemplation actually does rewire the brain. That the neuroplasticity, which the first time I read this term, those of you who are in psychology and neuroscience, you're so comfortable with this, but I, I remember talking with some of the professors in the psychology department about what exactly is neuroplasticity. That sounds rigid. That sounds like you, you, dr you were driven into a prefab mold and the plasticity part really threw me. Well, it was just the opposite. It was the malleability of the brain, the capacity that we have to change. And the fascination around the role of prayer and personal reflection. We were really pushing into this. And one of the discoveries that Dr. Newberg and his team made that 12 minutes a day of prayer and meditation actually could change us, and that it only took 10 weeks of prayer and meditation, 12 minutes a day, to actually rewire the brain and fundamentally dispose us to better outcomes. Now, when we look at an integration of Evagrius and Newberg, how do we begin to understand the damaging effects of anger? Anger is an incredibly ruthless emotion. In fact, Evagrius considered it to be the, the passion or uh, vice that destroyed more people because it not only ruined relationship, it often resulted in violent behavior. And so he, he commented frequently, and you can only imagine what he must have seen uh, in both the monks and the people who surrounded the community. He said and he noted that anger interrupts our ability to be charitable. Now, what did Newberg discover? Newberg discovered that anger actually interrupts the capacity that we have to think logically. And you see these discoveries in the fourth century, these discoveries with neuroscience in the 21st century, and there's so many ways in which the observation of behavior and now the discoveries of modern science are really confirming one another. Anger causes us to lose the capacity for compassion. One of the things that is just so critical today is can we actually connect with people very different than ourselves? Now, one of the wonderful parts of our uh, Department of Psychology and the emphasis that it places on neuroscience is this whole discovery of the mirror neuron system. And I became fascinated with this because how do you experience rapport? When you experience rapport, it's your mirror neuron system and my mirror neuron system lighting up. And when we feel distance from people or anger and hostility, it shuts that down completely. And the capacity that you actually have to turn on a friend or on an associate is a direct result of you shutting down in a fit of rage or an expression of anger. Anger also releases just all of these neurochemicals that really destroy us. Uh, in the book that Jane Wilson is reading, Thanks, a book by Dr. Robert Emmons, he actually documents the release of these stress hormones, uh, cortisol, and uh, epinephrine that actually reflect anger in the bloodstream, or the, the results of anger being released and, and the chemical effect that this has uh, uh, on the bloodstream. Now, one of the things that I became interested in is what had caused this minister to lose his temper 
and literally completely uh, melt down. And a, a phrase that has just become a recent discovery of mine, one that you're familiar with, is this term amygdala hijacks. The amygdala is our fear, our fear flight trigger. It's the part of us that actually registers the emotions and whether or not we should move quickly. And I was so, so struck by the fact of what sets us off. And here are the five amygdala hijacks. And why do I put these in front of you? Because in talking to you or members of, of the student community, uh, three of the five that have been mentioned to me were in the five classic causes of meltdowns, of outrages, of people feeling uh, just so offended that they reacted too strongly. The first, being condescending and showing a lack of respect. Now, if, if that kind of expression makes you angry, that you are right in the, the center of one of the main causes of so many angry uh, and disruptive responses being treated unfairly, being held to unrealistic expectations, feeling like you're not being listened to or heard, and being unappreciated. Now, what was the point in sharing these? It's not that you, if, if you instantly react every time you experience one of these, that is what you have to overcome. But how do you begin to overcome it? Well, the literature is now showing that through the simple practice of gratitude, literally being able to learn how to pay attention, as the psalmist Davis, David instructs us, being able to express gratitude is one of the ways in which we begin to rewire our brain so that when we experience condescension or a lack of respect or feeling unappreciated, our first response isn't one of anger, but it's one of self-discipline where we can actually reroute our life. And so how do we begin to cultivate gratitude? How do we become those embodiments of both a gracious spirit and really ways in which people experience the presence of God through our presence in their life? The first, it begins with our own attitude. One of the things that I always learned as a child, uh, my father always emphasized that the two things I could control were my attitude and my effort. That I couldn't control what happened to me, but I could control how I responded to it and what kind of physical effort I made as a result of it. The second was how prayer and our spiritual disciplines can actually impact us. Now, I love this research because it just shows the combination of both our spiritual life and cutting-edge science and what it's actually helping us understand about these very basic core religious practices and the health and well-being that they bring to each one of us. First, it enhances social awareness and compassion. This is the mechanism or the method for developing empathy. Second, it strengthens the anterior cingulate that begins to negotiate this space between our reason and our emotion. It helps us engage in emotional self-control. In other words, it gives us the capacity to avoid making career-limiting mistakes. And as I was sharing with Ben what I was going to be talking about this morning, he had never heard the expression career-limiting mistakes, but it quickly led to us ruminating together about people that we have observed who've literally engaged in these patterns that resulted in career-limiting mistakes. You're at the front end of your adult life, and as you look out on your life, and we hope it's long and bountiful, you're going to have opportunities to respond graciously to very ungracious people. And the capacity that you will have to make a gracious response to an ungracious person is going to be fundamentally tied to the capacity you have undertaken to develop a spirit that honors God and really embodies his love and value. Third is to serve others. This has the capacity to really cultivate uh, the kind of human connection that makes us love and appreciate others. It helps cultivate communities filled with love, communication, and intellectual stimulation. And ultimately, it teaches us how to appreciate. Now, when you entered this morning, you found a card on your chair. Can you pull out that card right now? Now, ben, ben mentioned to me that earlier this semester, you had an opportunity to write a thank you note. And so I think he was trying to tell me that so that I would know that you had practice. <laughs> I think he was also wanting me to be sure that uh, I wasn't too repetitive. But here's what I want you to do. Who in your life, I mean, who comes to mind has made a great impact on your life? or has really made a difference for you at a particular period of time, and you feel grateful for them, but you have never stopped to say thank you. 
We're going to take two minutes. Joel's going to come up. We're going to, they're just going to play a song in the background. And I want you to take two minutes. I want you to add, address this postcard. Write three things to this person. Very brief. Why you appreciate them. And then when you leave this morning, I want you to put these in the boxes. We're going to mail these for you. And they'll, they'll arrive before Thanksgiving. Now, as you prepare to write your message of gratitude, it doesn't always have to be about joyful things. I started with a very difficult situation that awakened in us uh, an attentiveness to anger. And I want to conclude with a sad story, but one that has a very joyful, uh, a joyful uh, outcome. Back in uh, the summer of 1982, I did my first ministry internship at Reedwood French Church in, Newber or in Portland, Oregon. And the pastor I worked with there was a man named Don Green. Don was a 32-year-old uh, young father and pastor, just a brilliant man, a wonderful pastor, great speaker. He had gone to Princeton Theological Seminary, and I was headed to Princeton Theological Seminary that following fall, largely because of the influence of Don. Six weeks into the semester, uh, he was going to visit me at the halfway break uh, of the semester at Princeton, a similar type setup to, all, to our fall four-day. Well, that six weekend, I get a tragic call that Don has been killed in an accident on Mount Hood. He'd gone up to get firewood, and in the midst of getting firewood, had gotten into a widow maker, a term that, that uh, loggers use that refers to a tree that's dead but still standing. When you get into it, it breaks apart, comes down, and crushes you. That had happened to Don. As a result of that, of course, it was a time of great mourning for his family, his wife, his children, huge church communities, and certainly uh, I felt it acutely. He was a favorite pastor, a wonderful mentor, and a great inspiration to me. Well, this, uh, this past September, I was in Wheaton uh, on college business. We were there to participate in the Council of Christ or the Christian College Consortium, pardon me, and I saw Don's brother, Dave. And I literally have not seen Dave since Don's memorial service. And it triggered in me just a progression of feelings of thanksgiving at what happened as a result of this horrible tragedy. As a result of this tragedy, I actually pursued a relationship with Diogenes Allen, who became my thesis advisor at Princeton. Dr. Allen introduced me to Pascal. Pascal taught me how to think through the right use of reason in our religious faith. Dr. Allen taught me to how, how to think through the problem of evil and suffering. As my life fast forwards, there are so many positive outcomes as a result of the brief but profound influence that Don had on my life. And there's two ways in which I could look back on that tragedy. One is to look back on it as a tragedy that forever ruined the lives of others or to look back on it as a way that we see it as a great tragedy that redirected us to find God in a deeper way. It's my hope that as you look at your life that you will be able to pay attention in a way that brings the best out of even hard circumstances and that you really learn how to be an embodiment of God's grace as you love and work with one another. Thank you for your time and attention this morning. God be with you as you write this thank you note. Take two minutes and then Ben will come up and close us. God be with you.